Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The Lord be with you. And also with you. A couple of things um, on our calendars coming up you may want to write down. On February the 7th, that's a Sunday, at 2 o'clock we'll have our February board meeting. And at that time we will finalize the arrangements for our chili dinner. And I know we said the tickets, we need to have them in by the 10th, but it would sure be good if we had a pretty accurate number when we get together on the 7th. So uh, we need to either know that those people have got them and they're going to pay or whatever so we can figure out how much chili to cook because we don't know. Uh, uh, I hate to run out, but I'd rather run out than have way too much. So uh, we'll work on that. And uh, we'll, that's the, really the only thing other than a financial report that will happen at that meeting, so it shouldn't last long. I know that's Super Bowl Sunday. Some of you couldn't care less. Some of you will be anxious to get out and go watch the commercials. Whatever the case is, I promise we'll be here like from 2 to 3, and then we'll be out and gone. On uh, February the 12th, of course, is our chili dinner. And then February the 13th, we will be having uh, Tom Griffin's memorial service here at the sanctuary at 11. Uh, Everybody's invited. Of course, we'll be doing social distancing and masks and all those sorts of things. Uh, and then at a later time, uh, we're going to go with AJ out to the uh, the uh, National Cemetery in Tomball and uh, inter the ashes. We're looking forward to doing that with you, AJ, when the time comes. AJ's here today. She's just not going to sing today. She's going to sing out there. She's not going to sing up here. And since she's going to sing out there, and I'm going to sing up here. We're all going to sing if you're willing to put your mask on when we sing. Yep. So I will give you a heads up before the singing starts and we'll get ready to do that. Um, there is a food drive going on for the Boy Scouts. There's some flyers laying back on the tables. Uh, they're going to contribute every single thing that comes into the Boy Scout food drive to our blessing box, which is a plus for us. The blessing box has been pretty actively used lately. And so I know sometimes people come by and uh, put stuff in. I know that happens because I'll leave in the morning and it's pretty full. I'll come back in the afternoon, it's empty. I'll come back later in the afternoon and it's got stuff in it. So people are coming by and doing what the sign says. Take what you can, leave you know, leave what you need, take something. And so they're, they're not just taking, but um, it seems to be a ministry that's making a difference, uh, a great difference. And uh, other than that, I don't, know of anything else um, I put a link on the Facebook page Methodist Hospital opened up open registration for a little while on one day Thursday I think it was was it Thursday Johnny I think it was Thursday and I put the link on there right now it's closed again but if you're in, if you haven't been signed on the list and you're interested go in and find that on Facebook click on that link and bookmark it so you can keep going because it'll be reopened again as soon as they get some more <coughs> of the vaccine. I get my second shot on Saturday, and so I'll probably be sick on Sunday, and so uh, you can count on that even making the board meeting shorter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so I have uh, nothing further to offer for that. Hey, uh, Ann, would you play something? For me? As you're able, would you, Johnny, crank this one up a little bit, number seven. Give it a little bit more juice, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit, okay. Uh, as you're able, if you're willing, put on your mask and stand up and we'll sing. My Jesus, I love
And if you will remain standing for the reading of the gospel, the gospel lesson this morning comes from the gospel of Mark in the first chapter, starts with the 21st verse. They went to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thanks be to God. And if you will remain standing as we have the Apostles' Creed this morning, bear with me just one second. My fellow Christians, what is it we believe? God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father.
Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come before you humbly today, realizing how broken and lost we are. Coming before you, not only to confess our failings, but to pray for your strength and your amazing grace to lead us from this place into the work you've called us to do in your kingdom. We live in a time when so many are out of work. So many have lost jobs from no fault of their own. So many have died. It seems like such a dark time. But it is out of the darkness that light can shine the brightest. Even the smallest spark of light begins to illumine the darkness. And God, you've called us to be the light of the world. In this time when people are fearful, you've caused, uh, called us to be brave. In this time when people are angry, you've called us to be people of peace. It's through your abounding grace that we have the strength to continue on to carry the light into the world. Believing that if we can just show where the light is, they will turn to you. We can extend the invitation and some will actually respond. So God, today as we gather here, we study the lessons of Jesus. We hear about his amazing miracles and his healings. And we look around in our own room and we realize the amazing ways that healing has taken place even here. We're thankful for your grace with us when we hurt for the power you have to help us get through our times of grief. And the way that you show us what joy looks like when the sun comes up in the mornings. We're thankful for the teachings of Jesus when he stood up to the powers that be, when he stood up for the oppressed, and when he taught us to pray. When he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to sing, Ask Ye What Great Thing I Know. Now, and you can remain seated as we sing. Ask Ye What Great Thing. Who reviles my 
stay socially distanced and mask. I think we can continue that even when AJ comes back. She'd probably prefer that over doing continuous week after week solos. But yep. well, we are grateful for the times when she has done that. Our scripture reading today comes from the uh, from 1 Corinthians, it's in the 8th chapter. It's the first 13 verses. Actually, it's the whole chapter. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by Him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, for whom all things and from, from, for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through him whom we exist. It's not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers from whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and, wound, and wound their conscience when it's weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their failing, falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now I know for you Methodists, this is a complicated thing when it says food will not bring you closer to God. <laughs> we usually eat at everything when we can, don't we? Yes. Some people have referred to us as knife, knife and fork Methodists. You know, this whole thing about puffed up knowledge is an interesting thing because sometimes I, we, we run into this all the time. You, you know people that are so forceful in their belief that you don't even want to you, you don't even want to talk to them. They've got it figured out. They think they know. They are absolutely sure that they're right. And it doesn't leave very much room for discussion. They just know they're right. And this Paul is addressing that to people they are talking about things of the faith, but that's exactly what Paul's talking about when you go to those people and they say, our way is the only way. If you don't go our way, you're going the other way. Now, we all know that goes on, right? I drive past signs all the time through these little country churches where somebody will have a sign and it'll say something like, turn or burn. Um, there's more offering of Christ as a solution to hell than there is offering of Christ as the salvation of life. We give so much power to, to use in fear as a tactic to get us to, people to do what they want that we get used to doing that. And we're all guilty of it at some point. 
I remember, you know, trying to use that tactic on my children when I was raising them. I later found there were better ways, but, uh, you know, fear of the paddle did keep them out of the street some of the time. Some of the time. But I also learned that there are ways to deal with it. Now, you know, we, we, so we live in this time where, where knowledge is important, and we put a, a huge amount of emphasis on knowledge. You, you got to go to school, you got to get educated, you got to know all the stuff. But you can be the smartest person in the world and have no understanding of who and what Jesus Christ is. You can even have really good behavior. I mean, you can do really good things for people and it not have any relationship at all to serving the kingdom. I, I'm always reminded, you know, I was in Rotary for years and Rotary does great things, but it's not a church. It has almost eliminated polio in the world, thanks to work with Bill Gates and Rotary, and Rotary International, but they're not a church. They have rules we can't have. Did you know that if you don't make a Rotary meeting every week, they can kick you out. And if you can't make one at home in your hometown, then you have to make another one in another town within two weeks of the time you missed. Or they can ask you to leave. And sometimes you wonder why we couldn't have rules like that at church. Maybe our attendance would be better. But using that fear tactic doesn't work. So y'all don't know a guy named Jim Soller, but he was a friend of mine. He was the secretary for the Rotary Club. I spent a whole entire year not missing a meeting. I was ready for my one year perfect attendance. Perfect attendance, man. I wasn't afraid. I was doing it because I was excited to get my one year perfect attendance pen. And I went my one year and I went to Jim and I said, I'm ready for my pen. And he said, we don't give them anymore. <laughs> but if you got some money, you can buy a Paul Harris fellowship. That's the way this, this whole thing about knowledge works. Knowledge can never solve all of the problems. Sometimes it takes faith. Sometimes we have to go beyond what we know into what we hope. I, I, you know, I'm confronted with that, I guess, maybe more than some people because I'm a preacher and I do a whole lot of bedside visits, or used to before COVID, when people are dying. And I, I'm with a lot of people that are grieving and going through the grief process. And, and what I know is that in the Christian faith, we can get through that because we have hope. And that hope isn't about knowledge. It's about something that happens inside of you. It's a thing. Wesley called it that experience of faith. I mean, it's fine to rely on Scripture. Scripture's important. We should read them. We should study them. We should pay attention to them. It's fine to pay attention to tradition. You know, we have traditional things we do. We stand for the reading of the gospel. Those are, those are great things to do. You don't go to hell if you don't do them. Okay? They're just great things to do. But... but there's another component to that, that that, you know, Wesley went to a meeting on May the 24th. It was called all, we call it Aldersgate Day, in a place called Aldersgate in England, where he went to a, be at a meeting that he didn't want to be at with some people he didn't particularly like to hear something he already knew. And God moved and did something. There was an experience, a heartwarming experience. And that's what I think this is talking about here. Don't expect you to be able to have a, a checklist like you do when you're going to go camping or when you're going to move that you can check this off and this off and this off and when it all got, I'm good, I'll be saved. It takes something else. There's some hidden component that only you and God know about when it happens. Now we celebrate things when that happens and, and so here in a little while we're going to have some baptisms in the church. And, and, and I'll talk more about that then. Baptisms are great, but, but baptism doesn't save you. It's an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. It means that we've already done something in here, but it's a process that is only beginning. I know some people think baptism is it. You get baptized, you're once saved, always saved. You don't have to do anything else. Let me just tell you, when you get justified with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the work for your life just starts. That's when you start to see when you make mistakes, when you start to see what evil is in the world. You start to understand what evil looks like. Even if you were a part of that evil before, you start to separate yourself from it. It is seldom a, a lightning kind of <laughs> explosion all at once experience. It's a gradual thing. And over time, some of your friends, they say, man, something happened, you're different. You may not even notice it yourself. 
I tend to not like that dogmatic, this is the answer way of doing business. Ever. Even when I was in business, it just irritates me to no end. So some people would say, well, yeah, you don't respond well to authority. And in some cases that's true. But I, I think more than that, it's that, I, that those people that are so dogmatic and so fixed on what they say, they struggle with the scripture because the scripture's inconsistent. If you read Matthew, it says one thing. You read Mark, it says something else. You read John, it says something else entirely different. And you cannot put them all together and have them make total sense because Matthew was written to a whole group of people that were studying under Matthew that were Jews, that were trying to understand who the Messiah was. Mark was written at a much earlier time. John was written to the Johannine community. They were written to different people. Just exactly the same way is that we meet here in Pasadena and we do church one way and folk over in, in West Houston somewhere, they might do it a little different. In some areas, people might all wear a coat and tie. Other places, they might wear blue jeans. We're not a homogenous society. Praise God. We don't all look the same. We don't all act the same. We don't think the same. And when we start to think that some bit of knowledge that I have makes me better than you, I think that's exactly what the Scripture's talking about when it says knowledge puffs up. I might have more college more theological training, that doesn't make me closer to God than you. You see, that relationship is between you and God, and I can't do anything except tell you, work on it. As much as I love you, I can't take you there. I can't move you into the light of Christ. You've got to, you and Christ do that. That's the thing that happens between you and God. Sometimes in the church, we forget that. Sometimes we think, oh, well, if we just do this right, or we just put this sign up, or we just put this thing up, our attendance will grow and we'll have more church. I couldn't care less how many people we have. What I'm concerned with is are the people we have getting closer to God? Because if they are, then we'll have a better church. But let me tell you, friends, we're still imperfect. <laughs> we're full of imperfect people and you've got an imperfect pastor and We've got imperfect everything around this place. We've even got a leak or two in the ceiling. We're not perfect. We're striving to be better tomorrow than we are today. What worries me most about many of us, especially at this time, we're looking forward. I hear it all the time. I can't wait till everybody's had the vaccine and goes back to normal. Well, let me just tell you, I'm afraid civilization as we know it has changed. I think normal is going to look different. But it's still going to be normal. Don't miss out on today because of what you think is going to happen in June. You know, I, I get so mystified by people's uh, attitude about everything. I mean, you know, everybody's all concerned about what's going on in Washington, D.C. Those people don't know our names. They don't care who we are. The election's over. Now we're left on our own. And we are called by God to not worry about that, but to love one another. To treat others like we want to be treated. We have a calling that's way stronger, way bigger, way more powerful than any of that stuff. And we should spend the same amount of time worrying about what's important as we do the stuff that's not there was a great book written a long time ago, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, It's All Small Stuff. The other great book I've referred to it before, Who Moved My Cheese, that's another great book. These are not long books, you can read them in a few minutes. But our priorities are not about getting smarter, richer. Let me tell you, churches have figured out, if they didn't figure it out before 2020 came along, having a big honking Starbucks coffee bar in the lobby doesn't help you when COVID-19 is around. Having the biggest playground on earth so you can attract all the kids or the greatest bus ministry there ever was, they don't make any difference today. The playing field has been leveled. There was a time when everybody said, oh, I want to be a part of a mega church. I'll tell you what, people now want to be a part of one our size because they can socially distance, come to church and sing. 
In other words, things change and what was the preferred thing isn't anymore and now maybe for the first time in years we have the opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this community. To continue to reach out, to continue to do stuff, to continue to take that message of hope. Every when, in, when I was at the bigger church, we and we've done it here too, we had confirmation every year. Confirmation is all about knowledge. We teach people about Jesus and about Moses and about all that other stuff that happened in the Bible. And then we teach them about how the Christian church happened and we teach them about Methodist beliefs. That's what confirmation is all about. We get to the end of it. These are usually sixth graders. And we say, okay, we finished all that. Now, if you want to, you can be baptized and become a part of the church. I was teaching confirmation many years ago at Deer Park Methodist. And one of the young men said, nope, don't want any part of that. And I felt like a failure. I, I went to the pastor. I said, I'm, I'm a failure. I taught them all this stuff and they don't want to do it. And he said, if you can't say no, yes means nothing. True. The choice we make to be followers of Jesus Christ is not a choice of, of anything other than us deciding that we want to be a follower of Jesus. Not a fan. Not somebody that has knowledge about him. We can talk all we want about whether he walked here or there, how many times he went to this or that. What I want to know is, do you know that he's your Savior? How do you know? What difference does it make? See, those are the questions that dig into your soul. So, uh, you know, I knew this about Methodist preachers before I became one, because I've gone several times to the preacher and said, what does this scripture mean? And if you've been around a Methodist church a long time, you know what the answer is. Well, I don't know. Let's figure it out. Now, there are plenty of places you can go where somebody will tell you what it means. Let me tell you, be careful when you get into 1 Corinthians because it tells the women to be quiet at church. I'm not saying that. <laughs> it tells the women to keep their head covered when they come to church. You're going to take it all absolutely literal that we're all sinning right now. But you have to go back and why did Paul say that? And who was he saying it to? And what did it mean? And how does that compare to us today? I want to tell you, I'm thankful that women can come to church and be active and have a voice. I remember some years ago, we had a former, former Catholic with us. We did Christmas Eve service and I asked her if she wanted to read the gospel. And she said, that's not permitted. I said, by who? Well, she had a Catholic upbringing and the, the females could not read the gospel. Only the priest did. You see what I'm saying about the rules and the dogma and how it can keep you from Christ? I believe if you want to serve God, you need to serve Him. I don't care how tall you are, how old you are, what your gender is. I think you have been called by Jesus Christ to be a servant and have servant ministry. Now, some of you will do that in a workplace. Some of you will do it somewhere else. But well, we all have a call. And it isn't about how much you know. It's not about how many scriptures you can quote. Let me just tell you, people have a misconception. I was at a Kiwanis meeting, a different club than Rotary, and uh, one of our fine Pasadena veterans, really nice guy, older fella, he came up to me and he says, well, you're a preacher, aren't you? I said, yeah. He said, well, in Jonah, in the third chapter, that fourth verse, what does he mean? I said, I have no earthly idea. But you're a preacher. You don't have it memorized? No. And let me tell you one reason why. Roy Heller is a, is a professor of Old Testament up at Perkins. He's from Baytown. Grew up in the Pentecostal church. Uh, memorized the gospel of uh, the, the letter, James' letter, epistle, word for word in the King James Version. Even today, he can just rattle it off. And you know what he said? He said the hardest thing he ever did was a Bible study that included James because in his little pea brain he thought he already knew it. The hardest thing you can ever learn is something you think you already know. Well, let me just tell you, friends, Paul is addressing that when he says knowledge puffs up. It's not what you know, it's who you know. It's not what you know about Christ, it's do you know who Christ is. It's not what you can do, what Christ can do for you, but it's what can you do for the kingdom today. This puffed up knowledge is irritating to me. I hope I'm not guilty of it. If I am, I hope I get confronted. I don't enjoy being around it, and I'm sure you really don't either. 
I think the, the, a group of people that faithfully gather together to learn and study the Word of God, hoping to be closer to God at the end of the day, become close, become vibrant, and become missionaries to the kingdom. And that's what I hope we establish, always hope we establish here. For those of you that are watching online today, I know that sometimes it's hard to conceive what we're really talking about, but I just want you to know that God's calling you to. And you're invited to come and worship with us anytime you want to. We worship at 5.30 on Saturday nights and 11 on Sundays. If you're sick or not feeling well, you should stay home. If you can't drive because of other issues right now and, and you're fearful because of the COVID-19, then you should stay home. But you're a part of our community and you're invited to be with us. I found it disappointing that food didn't bring me closer to God. But I knew that. Neither do material items. Neither does wearing a robe or having a, an ordination certificate. None of that. Don't put me on, on a pedestal. I'm not an icon. We all wrestle with the same things. And I think when people outside that we meet, those friends that we meet, the people that we know but that don't go to church, when they find out that we don't think we're better than them, when we don't think that we've got it down, and we think we're struggling just as much as they are, we're wondering what happens on the other side and how we get to that place. When they figure that out, I think they probably want to join us too. Because it's fun to be on the journey. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Gracious God, we come before you humbly again. We're, we're here trying to figure out what you want us to do and how you want us to do it. And if we're guilty of puffed up knowledge, God, forgive us. Help us to be gentle, merciful, and kind. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, before we go to our last hymn today, I want to invite some young folks. And we've got to be careful and do social distancing and all this stuff. I've got to find my mask. Hey, love you. Let me find it. <laughs> so, um, I would normally invite everybody to come, but you can come, but you've got to come six foot distance, okay? So, uh, then we need uh, Brittany and you and, and uh, Amelia come, right? And then also Nelson, y'all come. And if the others want to stand kind of close, y'all can come, but just stand, uh, stay six foot away. So we can fist bump. That's what we can do. There we go. Yeah, we can go now. Y'all come over this way. All three of you stand here. You get to come over here too. You stand, turn right, right over there. Okay. And uh, if somebody wants to take pictures, that's fine. No, no problem at all. Uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we're initiated into Christ's holy church. We're incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and give new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered without price. So today, I present to you Nelson Bradley Durant, is that right? Yes, sir. And Amelia Rose Shaver, is that correct? And Brittany? Michelle Shaver. Michelle Shaver, okay. Now, Brittany, you've been baptized already? Yes, sir. Okay, so we're going to just baptize those two over there. And they are here today for that. So, Brittany, I want you to answer for Amelia. Nelson, you need to answer for yourself. Yes, sir. Okay. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness and reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? You can say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with Christ? with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. Yes, sir, I do. I'm going to ask you this just about Amelia. Will you nurture her in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly at a later time, and to lead a Christian life? I do. 
According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's Holy Church and serve as Christ's representatives in the whole world? And you're going to be sponsoring Amelia. Will you, will you who sponsor her, support and encourage her to live her Christian life? Yes, sir. All right, now this is for y'all, you people out there. Uh, and we don't, you don't have it written, so I'll just tell you what to say when it's your time. Do you, as Christ's body of the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Your answer is, I do. I do. Will you nurture one another? in Christian faith and include these persons standing before you now in your care. And here's what you would say if you could read it. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life eternal. Okay, so we are now down to that place and over to here. <clears throat> Eternal Father, let us pray. Eternal Father, with nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters. You brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark with water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow, which you saw your people as slaves in Egypt. You led them to freedom throughout the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan, the land, which you promised. In the fullness of time you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb, he was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in a baptism of death and resurrection. So God, we ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit to bless the gift of water in those who receive it, to wash away their sin, clothe them in righteousness throughout their lives, that dying and being raised with Christ, they may share in final victory. Amen. Okay, if you would stand and if you, you can with, stand behind her. If we get her to kneel right over there, and you turn around right here and kneel right there. And normally, I would have help and people would be holding stuff, but we can't have anybody up here, so we're going to do this quickly. Nelson, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and pray God's rest, riches of blessing on you forever. Amen. We can all say amen. 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 Hey, Amelia, are you ready for this? Are you ready? <laughs> She's like, I'm going to get my dress wet. <laughs> Amelia, I baptize you in the name of the Father in the Son and the Holy Spirit, I pray God's blessings on you from now and for always in your whole life. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we can clap, I think. All right, now y'all stand up and turn and face the audience out here. And so uh, these two, well, actually, you can make this decision if you want to. This young lady is a preparatory member. She will hopefully grow up and become a part of this church or a church somewhere, but hopefully ours. Uh, and Brittany, are you willing to become a part of this church? Most How about you, young man? Okay, so all you need to do is answer this question. Will you support this church with your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? And your answer is, I will. Yes, sir, I sure will. All right, now we can welcome them into membership. Uh, let's applaud. And, thank you. and you guys can go be seated. Uh, normally, we would have you all stand in the back and everybody shake your hand. You can stand there and everybody can fist bump you on the way out later, but <laughs> we're glad to have you. Thank you so what much. What a joy to have you. You bet. Welcome again. <laughs> oh, Brittany. Thank you so much. Now, you, you'll think we, we have... Uh, this was all sort of planned, so our closing hymn today is Jesus Loves Me. I know most of you know the first verse. I wonder how many of you know the five other verses. We need one. There's one in uh, Indian, uh, Cherokee, I think, and Ch uh, Jap we're, we're not going to sing those. <laughs> there's, there's three verses. Friends, uh, you're invited now as, you are, as you're able to be. Stand, put on your mask if you want to sing, and let's sing. Uh, let's sing. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to them belong, they all be strong. Yes, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, this 